I now look to Lord Michael Howard to continue the case for the proposition. Well, Mr. President, it is, of course, a great privilege uh, to be here this evening as we approach the 40th anniversary of the election of our country's first woman prime minister to debate her achievements. Uh, and I'm particularly grateful to you, Mr. President, for inviting an invader from the Fens uh, to, uh, to join you for this occasion. And I want to begin, if I may, by congratulating the first two speakers, who I think were, to use a phrase much used by the second speaker, quite exceptional. <laughs> Indeed, the one thing that I failed to follow in the second speaker's argument was her attack on exceptionalism. Yeah. Because we are talking about a hero. And heroes are, by definition, exceptional. So, of course, of course it's true. Of course it's, of course it's true that Margaret Thatcher was herself exceptional. That was one of the things that made her a hero. But I want to follow the Honourable Lady, the second speaker, at least in one respect. She asked you to cast your minds back to a time before you were born. <laughs> and indeed, in order to gain any perspective on Margaret Thatcher's achievements, you have to place them in context. And in particular, you have to recall the state of our country in 1979. We were, it is true, universally regarded as the sick man of Europe. Just a short time before, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Denis Healy, was obliged to turn back from Heathrow Airport in the most humiliating circumstances to deal with a financial crisis which led to his seeking a loan from the IMF to prevent the country from going bust. And in the winter, before the election of 1979, the infamous winter of discontent, people were literally unable to bury their dead because the workers involved were on strike. The prognosis for the country was dire. I remember, I'm afraid I'm old enough to remember, I remember listening to a conversation with someone who was regarded as one of the great gurus of the day. I can see no way through, he said. Speaking just before the election, he said, either we'll get a government which will make no real effort to deal with the country's problems, in which case things will go from bad to worse, or we'll get a government which will make an effort to face up to those problems, in which case it will become so unpopular that it can't possibly last more than one term. It is to Margaret Thatcher's great credit that she did face up to those problems and overcame them. She turned the economy round so that far from being the sick man of Europe, we came to be regarded with envy by Europe as the example which many sought to follow. She gave us back our self-respect and it's difficult to think of higher praise than that. Of course, she had to make hard choices she had to take on and overcome some of the most powerful forces in the land. And yes, it's true. Not absolutely everyone benefited from the changes that were necessary to turn the country round. But most people did. And the working class as a whole certainly did. We've heard a lot about the right to buy. Over a million council house dwellers, working class people, not exceptional, over a million of them were able to buy their homes and were able to enjoy not only the dignity and pride which come from home ownership, but were able to pass on property to their families. Two million women entered the workforce during the period when Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister. Just think of the difference that made to the working class. And yes, the power of the trade unions was brought under control. Let me give you one example of how that power affected the working class. 
I was a barrister before I was foolish enough to enter the House of Commons. And I once represented a man who'd been ordered by his union to march against Ted Heath's earlier plan to reform industrial relations. He refused to march, and as a result, he was fined by his union. He refused to pay the fine, which was then added to his union subscription. So his subscription, he paid the subscription, but he wouldn't pay the fine, and his subscription fell into arrears, and as a result, he was expelled from the union. Now, in those days, we suffered from something called the closed shop. It lay at the heart of the power which the trade unions exercised. It meant that in industry after industry, if you didn't belong to the union, you couldn't get a job. You couldn't work. The man I represented lost his job. Because of the closed shop, once he'd been expelled from the union, he was sacked and he was unable to work again. That was the kind of tyranny which the trade unions exercised in those days, and I defy everyone, anyone to argue that the working class benefited from it. The man I represented was working class. He didn't benefit from trade union power, he suffered from it. And it took Margaret Thatcher to lift that yoke from the working class. Of course, as I said earlier, it is very regrettably true that not everyone benefited, and we've heard a lot already about the communities, including the coal mining communities, which lost jobs as their industries declined and the mines and the factories in which they worked were closed. I grew up on the edge of the South Wales coalfield and I knew at first hand how the scars of the interwar depression still were raw. But the closure of the mines, which was inevitable, could have been handled in a much more orderly and humane manner if it hadn't been for Arthur Scargill's determination to turn the future of the coal industry into an attempt to bring down the elected government of our country. And the bit of truth is that the coal mines and the factories which were closed were making losses, often large losses. Now, when an economy has to be turned round, government has a choice. You can either pour subsidies into your loss-making industries, which have to be paid for by raising taxes on the productive and efficient sectors of the economy, making them less productive and less efficient and, crucially, less competitive, with all the consequences for jobs and the working class which that would bring. Or you can kind of try and keep the burden on the efficient part of the economy to a minimum so that jobs can be created and the working class can be benefited in a way which is best for the country as a whole. Margaret Thatcher made those hard choices and as a result of those hard choices, with inflation, which averaged 15% under the previous Labour government, was brought under control. As a result of those hard choices, we had the lowest proportion of long-term unemployed of all European community countries. And as a result of those hard choices, our economic performance in the 1980s was the best in any decade since the Second World War, better than all the major European economies, including Germany and France. Margaret Thatcher made those hard choices. And at the end of it all, we had an economy which was in much better shape, a country which had regained its self-respect, and a working class which reaped the benefits of the changes she made. So yes, Mr. President, yes. Margaret Thatcher truly was a working class hero and deserves to be remembered as such. <laughs>